then watch them get angry when the character they've always hated is taken from them. And they're like, but I like that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Gang store here again, and I have to tell you, I don't know how much more of this mess I can put up with. Before I get into it, well, you know what to do, if you know what's good for you. Souls, I hear me a rumor about poor little Orko, about to up and drop dead on us. Did some digging, and run across this bizarro interview with Sad Sack over here, talking about the new Netflix Motu show, Revelation. Now I say this interview is bizarre for a few reasons. One. I notice it's being hosted on Daily Motion and not on YouTube's. What is up with that? Almost as if they know if it's published on this here platform, it's most likely to be downvoted directly into Despondos. 2. The interview clearly states at the beginning, Warning. This interview contains mild spoilers. Announcing that you're killing off a main character is somehow a mild spoiler? Not only that, you're telling us precisely when it's going to happen at the end of the fourth episode. Why in the blue hell would you spoil your own show like that? Three. Kevin Sad Sack Smith goes on to describe the thought process behind doing such a thing. Uses words like insidious to describe the methods by which he and the other writers decided to weave this story. Going on to state that the majority of the writers all hated Orko. Now... I must admit, I tried to off the little floating midget a time or two myself, but certainly not out of hate. Nothing personal. It was just a job, you see. And if the unnamed one wants to pay me enough, I got no reservations whatsoever in bumping off a weirdo, infantilized, trolling wizard. <sighs> Come to think. Maybe me and Sad Sack have something in common. Seeing as how Netflix paid him enough to do the very same thing. Speaking of Sad Sack, that leads me to the fourth thing I noticed that made this interview quite bizarre. He went specifically out of his way during this interview to mention Ted Bitty as his boss. Over at Netflix. I find that rather interesting as in another recently published interview posted over at Fanboy Nation. He went and did the exact same thing. It's almost as if he's trying to tell us something about the working relationship he has with this character. Trying to paint a certain kind of picture here, you see? Hmm. One other strange thing I noticed, which is not related to Orko, but definitely worth mentioning, is later on Sad Sack goes on to say that Bitch Mayday was adamant that Evil Lynn be a focus for the show, saying she is low-key the focus for the show. Low-key as in Subversive. Subverting our expectations. Huh? He goes on to state that the two main characters, Attila and Evelyn, in the first five episodes have to deal with, like, 
if I'm not defined by this person, who am I? And they have to redefine themselves. So, if I'm deciphering this correctly, it means to say this is going to be a I don't need no man type of story coming from both the light and the dark hemispheres of Eternia. Uh, of course. He goes on to state that Evil Leon, presumably without Skeletor in the picture, will become soft hearted. Ah. Uh, don't you just hate when these things happen? I know I do. Why can't villains just be villains anymore? They always have to be sympathetic now. Always gotta be secretly a good guy. Makes me want a wretch. Particularly when the villain in question over here has the very word evil in her fucking name. It should always be a given that even Skeletor doesn't quite trust her. She's like Lady Macbeth, serving him and yet all the while plotting and scheming behind his back. It's a standard 80s cartoon trope, sure, but perhaps the most interesting version of it, as there's always a layer of some form of twisted romanticism between the two of them, like a love-hate relationship. Ah, and those are always the best kinds, aren't they? But back to Orko before I wrap this up. The fact that the majority of the writer's room outright hated this character is rather telling. The claim he ruined the show altogether, even though just about every show of the period had some similar form of mascot sidekick type character introduced, meant to appeal to the absolute youngest demographic, but also to sell sippy cups, breakfast cereals, and all other manner of cash grab type merchandise. It's another 80s cartoon nostalgia trope, sure. But truthfully, I never thought Orko to be that annoying. For my money, the worst of the bunch had to be that damn snarf. But hell, even he got to whoop up on some ass on occasion. Wasn't entirely useless. Orko, on the other hand, wasn't really given a fair shake in his own series. He's a well-accomplished master wizard on his home world of Trella. But the moment he crosses over into what we would call reality, all his magic works backwards, if at all. If there was ever a story to tell with the character, it would be one explaining this very handicap, and then doing something about it. George Lucas, creator of those Nobel Prize winning stellar combat documentaries, once explained his inspiration for the character of Yoda, saying, He comes from a tradition in mythological storytelling, fairy tales, of the hero finding a little creature on the side of the road who seems very insignificant, but who turns out to be the master wizard or the main guide for the hero. Just my opinion here, but this is precisely what needed to happen with Orko, particularly if this show is being marketed as a continuation of Filmation. We should have finally seen him come into his own, and once fulfilling some sense of destiny, then perhaps returning to Trulla to be with his people. It'd definitely be a worthy ending to his story. But unfortunate for him, the Netflix story group doesn't think him so worthy. If you ask me, they are the ones who are unworthy. And if they're unworthy, we best bid them and this land shark jumping mess a great big backhanded good journey. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.